As I said there in intro, Matt, we do have a, a very special guest, and it is indeed Barry Hennessy. Barry, you obviously announced your retirement back in November or December. How's it been since then? Um, emotional, Jack, we'll call it emotional. I know it's been great, it's been great. Um, I suppose it was a novelty at the start and getting all the nice messages from people. Um, but I suppose once the game's kind of kicked back in there in the last few weeks, you're kind of there saying to yourself, did I make the right decision or not? But um, I know it's been, it's been great. You talk about uh, making that decision in the games that you're probably referring to the, the Fitzgibbon Cup there. When did that come on the radar for you? Um, courtesy of Fintan O'Connor. Uh, I thought it was quietly just doing my, my part in Masters there below in uh, in Watford. And then the head kept down in the hall at and Fintan got wind that I was down there. And sure, uh, you, you couldn't say no to the club boss, especially when you're going back there full time. So. How, how did you find that, I suppose, when you announced retirement, Charlie thought that you'd be waiting for Kilmallock season to start before playing high level hurling, but you weren't long waiting for it. No, no. And um it was probably a little bit harder to start because just you're you're kind of I'm one of those people that you're either all in or you're not like and kind of into a sense we look just come when you can kind of a thing and I was kinda of itching at that as well. saying, I don't know, can I do that? Do you know it's not fair on other fellas, but um yeah, I got to play a couple of games before Christmas and played a couple of games and after Christmas and in fairness we done a, we had a good run to the last week there and nearly pipped the, the eventual champions, you know, so it yeah. wasn't, wasn't too bad. Yeah, I nearly pipped you well, I suppose, in the grand scheme of things. You probably gave you well their hardest game over the course championship only lost by three points. And we saw what they did to everyone else that you must take huge, I suppose, encouragement from that. Ah, uh, yeah, look, it was um, it was a, a great performance for ourselves, I suppose. No one gave us much of a chance, really, to be honest. I don't think people gave us much of a chance against DCU either. Um, we got a big result up in Dublin and probably missed maybe two eight in the second half against Joel. That ultimately cost us in the end. But look they're they're a fantastic team. They're littered with, with inter county stars all over the place. And even if you look at the the thirty odd lads they have in the bench as well, they'd make any college team, let alone any other team in, in the country, you know. So it was um it was great to kind of play to that standard. And even though it was probably a moral victory as such that you ran them so close, you know, it was it was big for the college to get back to the, the semi final again after I think it was, was it eight years or ten years since the last been there. So it was progress anyway. From a personal point of view, to keep out the likes of Mikey Kiley and Adam English and these boys, you, you must be happy with that yourself. I had very little to do with that, no, Jack. Uh, as I said to previous, um, we'd, uh, we'd a full forward that was converted to a full back. Um, that would turned out to nearly be a master stroke from Finton if we got over the line against Joel. Um, in fairness, he he gave, uh, I actually think they're best friends, would you believe, would you believe it? Um, Sam and Mikey, so I, I don't know, was there, were they taking it easy on each other or what? But um, in fairness to Sam, he, he, he gave Mikey plenty of it on the night, and, yeah, and his brother was in the corner then as well, and his brother gave uh, Adam plenty of it then as well. So um, I think the two boys were probably a bit uh, frustrated that they didn't get much uh, ball in the semi final and let loose in the final. So. And after the run to the semi final, was there any thought in your head to, to give John Kylie a bell and go back in? <laughs> No, no, he's um he's three very capable goalkeepers inside there at the moment. Um that all can do a job and will do the job that that John needs. So um I was just more than happy to to I suppose play something to keep your mind off uh, the the retirement side of things and the, the games that the lads are playing now. On the announcement, I suppose firstly, were you surprised with I suppose the outpour and afterwards, the the amount of messages you would have received and the impact on social media and I suppose then as well. What was it? When did you make the decision to, to actually leave the camp? Um, yeah, I suppose. Look, it's it's always I suppose it's always nice to get the messages. Um, you didn't realize, I suppose, the magnitude that you were going, of the messages you were going to get, like, um, and I suppose the impact that you may have had on people. I suppose all you want to kind of do when you finish your career is have the respect of the, the people that you played with, um, and so the management and teams that you've been involved with then as well. And to get that, and then obviously get everything else then from from supporters and friends and family. You know, it was it was nice. You no, know, it was nice. Such you know, I admit, I suppose, just fight all the sacrifices that were made over the years. Um, but in terms of the decision itself, I suppose uh, having two two young ladies under two was one of the the bigger factors. Um, and spending time a little bit more time at home, and even towards the end of the, the year last year, it was just getting a little bit harder to to get out the door to train, and there was no picking up the gear bag anymore at four o'clock and heading away. Um to be inside for five uh, it was nearly like uh, an army coordination on the battlefield trying to, to collect the to collect the small lady and drop her to um, her grandparents house to mind her for the, the hour or two till till Elaine came home and collected her so I just factored in those things and I suppose looked only small for so long and in fairness to Elaine she had said to me that if I wanted to go back for another year that 
we could make it work. But um, I probably asked for a lot already and, you know, used all my favours. So I said, look, uh, it's time now to, to pass it on to someone else. So. And you, you talk about passing on to someone else. The, the standard goalie in Limerick is extremely high at the moment. Obviously, Dave McCarthy and Jamie Power inside there, Jason Galan as well. And even in your own club, I know Conor Handy plays out the field for you, but for you, well, he, he's a goalie. So there's a lot coming through as well. Oh, massive! I think it's it's <laughs> whoever gets it for the next couple of years, and um, whenever Nicky decides to finish, you know, it's going to be still in very safe hands. You know, I think I've said this before. Um, Limerick have been incredibly blessed in the last twenty years to have the standard of goalkeeper that they've had. Um, I don't think you look back on any of the teams and say, you know, there was a weak link there. Um, we've we've been blessed in that department uh, for a long, long time now. Even back to to Tommy got rested, you know, it's it's been an incredibly safe hands. Um, and looking at what's coming after that, even you look at the likes of Tomas Lynch, um, there's another couple of lads there that are underage as well that are, you know, at a good age profile. Um, I've no doubt that they'll they'll get exposure uh, in years to come as well, and it'll just it'll continue to be in safe hands, whoever has it. Yeah, it looks to be in safe hands, but for so long we've been blessed to have yourself and Nicky, and you know your careers kind of merged in a, in a long way. Like, how much how much do you take from the fact that you pushed Nicky to I suppose a new level over the last? seven or eight years that he is considered one of the best in the current game and one of Limerick's best of all time. Yeah, look, it's um I think it's a good reflection on on yourself, Jack, and how you're performing, you know, but I suppose equally important for me was you you David or you Jason, Jamie back in twenty nineteen, um, Aaron Murphy previous to that. Like, you know, there's always been a good trio that have been there pushing each other, you know, so like the third choice pushes your second choice and your second choice pushes your first choice and your first choice is no, no choice but to, to perform, you know, so um, and look, I think we just, we work very well, there was a good dynamic there and um, there's a very positive and healthy relationship there uh, because you hear some horror stories in other places of the goalkeepers that don't get on and they're always trying to better each other and injure each other and get one up in each other, you know, whereas you know, we have a very healthy working relationship there but we just wanted the best for the the group um as opposed to just ourselves so you'd want to have a healthy relationship because you do be there an awful lot before other lads to train and like if Limerick are training we'll say at seven o'clock how early are the goalies there getting their warm up done? I see we're we're older now Jack as well so you know you have to go in and get the bit of strapping and you have to do the mobility work and the stretching and all that to make sure that you're still able to get on the pitch but uh I look you you probably start about 40 minutes sometimes before that uh, before the lads will start um, and just get your, your bit of striking or whatever to be done first and um, get that out of the way that if you are needed in the session then that you'd have a, a body of work done before before that so um, so yeah look to us you, you spent a lot of time I spent more time I'd say with Nikki in the last 10 years than I did with some of my family so um, so yeah look that, that was great and it was great to get a chance to, to work with him um, and see it literally at front row level to know the, his abilities and what he was capable of doing and what, he's, what he is capable of doing so and the role of the goalkeeper since you, you started, you know, for Kilmallet, that's obviously changed an awful lot. Now we even see some goalies come up and score and you've scored a share of frees for Kilmallet. Like, it's chalk and cheese, I suppose, when you started the role of the goalkeeper. I actually saw a video of my senior debut with Kilmallet against Kerry Spillane on YouTube floating around there at Christmas time. Um, I think it was Fimber Walsh or someone had shared it. And I think every ball that I got, I didn't even move with it. I just threw it up and hit it as far as I could down the field. Um, so if, I think if you did that now in the modern game, um, you wouldn't be long sitting on the sideline. I can tell you with the manager beside you. Um, but yeah, look, it's it's mad. You've gone from trying to make the the, mir the miraculous outstanding dive and save into the top corner to now at the moment, I, I suppose, look, it's heavily focused on restarts and positions and you know, being comfortable on the ball. Um, but your mentality changes completely from you want to be involved in everything and blocking those balls, like I said, in the top corner to you just want the team to win now and whether you you know if you just have to puck out the ball so be it or if you're involved even better again but as long as the team gets over the line you don't really mind what your your input is so. that evolution of the goalkeeper almost um resembles the evolution of limerick you know since you came in and you were in there i think in 13 but missed out on a monster medal and you were back in 14 full time but if you go back we'll say 10 years did you ever envisage this turnaround for limerick uh, you, you probably knew it was there. Um, it was just trying to get the monkey off the back was the big thing, you know. Um, we probably had, you know, similar quality players in the earlier years um, as every other county. But, you know, was there just the, the 73 and in the back of your head in 94, 96 and, you know, nearly getting there was that in the back. Was that just built into the, 
the psyche of, of Limerick at that stage. Um, but you could kind of see it then towards in the 15, 16, when the younger lads from the academy started to come in. And the likes of Tom Morrissey, who were just you know, natural born leaders, growed, that would have no problem at you know, 19, 20 years of age of, of pulling all their lads and you know, showing their leadership qualities and, and their standards. Um, and I think the standards that the younger lads brought in because they'd won so much at underage level as well. Um, going back to say myself and Nikki's time, I think we won very little. I think we won one minor match in two years. And I don't know how to be even win a 21s match. We were knocked out more than we were in it anyway. Um, but those lads, you know, they'd won minors, they'd won all Ireland's with schools, Hearty Cups, 21s, you know, so they'd, they'd medals. We were able to play for, play for our coffee with medals at that stage, you know, so when they brought, when they came into the senior ranks, they, they just dropped standards completely and brought it to a whole new level. And I think it was, in my case, it was the right place at the right time, so. Oh yeah, well, you'd sold for a few years at that stage, but was there any, was there any turning point that you remember, I suppose maybe turning to Nicky or turning to someone saying, this is changing, or was it more gradual with the lads coming in at training? Um, I suppose myself and Shem Siki used to travel the train a little bit together and we'd, we'd always say like that, say at the end of 17 you could feel that there was a, a mountainous amount of work that was uh, done in 17 um, and even though our results probably didn't go the way that we had hoped you could still see that the way we were trying to play had changed, the way we were training had changed, you know, the standards around the, the setup had changed. Um, lads were buying into it and then in 18 I think I think John even references himself look Galway saw a in the league was a watershed moment for the for the group um, and it probably probably set a few pulses racing uh, across the next couple of years because we had an awful lab of fall behind maybe by five or six points similar to Salt Hill and then just literally grinding it out then get over the line by one or two points you know so um, I think that Galway game was probably the the moment for the group that looked this was one of the big heavy hitters um or perceived heavy hitters that were in line to win another all Ireland and we were after turning them over on their own patch after being I think it was a day points down in one stage. So you, you you mentioned Galway there and obviously a few months later it's Galway again, not Ireland final and I suppose what was the build up like, you know, around Limerick because there was huge like fanfare, you know, it's different now where we're kinda of used to it, but back in eighteen it was the first Ireland final in eleven years and you're going for a a first alarm in, in, in 43, but there didn't seem too much panic in the squad. Even you mentioned Tom Morris before, his interview afterwards, he's one of the coolest men in Crow Park. What was it like that day, I suppose, going up to Dublin and just the day itself? I, I think it was, um, it's credit to John and to Caroline, like it was, it was incredibly calm. Do you know, there was no, there was an excitement more so than a nervousness. You know, because I think we'd we just had got um, John talks about incremental improvements. Like we got better across the year. Um, each game we got better, uh, got more comfortable with each other, and I suppose that belief um, was there as well. And like I suppose no one gave us really much of a chance against Galway. They were all saying that we were going to be bullied, and so we didn't have the the physicality maybe that they had. And I just remember the first ten minutes, like we. You know, whatever notion of not having physicality was blown out of the water, you know, because there was a couple of massive hits from our boys straight away, you know, and it probably set the tone for the for the rest of the game. Um, but look, it was incredibly calm. Um, like I said, lads were excited more so than anything else, and we were very well protected too. Um, we we weren't told to go home and lock ourselves up for two weeks before us. Um, you know, we were encouraged obviously to to live your life and to get on with your business, go to work, etc. Nothing has changed, and it was just I suppose treating it as another game, and that's that's the way it had been treated then for the, the four or five years after that every game is just a game and you know just go out, go out and enjoy it and go win your game so yeah I suppose an awful lot happened in the intervening years then you won obviously again in 2021 and 22 what was the difference between 2018 and 2022 I suppose last year seemed like there was a lot of pressure as well going for that three in a row which you had experience being there it, it did seem to be a level of calm again yeah, I think look, you've just incredibly, yeah, you've an incredibly driven group and competitive group. Um, the lads just want to win as much as possible, whether that's training matches, cards on the train, coming up. You know, lads are just extremely driven. Um, and I suppose there's a good, there's a great collective and a, a good bond there that um, lads just want to work for each other and do the best for the men inside them. And you know, there's no, there's no I. You know, it's it's we before me. So I think lads have completely bought into that and just that shines through on the pitch then and lads are willing to literally empty the tank for each other and anytime they've we've done that or they've done that we've got a result so and obviously for you success has, has followed at club level as well and i'll throw it over to you matt because you know a keen observer of the limerick senior championship for the last few years 
Uh, Barry, first of all, congratulations on a great career with the, with the county. Um, I, I, I presume we'll see you guarding the Balbeck net for another while. I'm, uh, I think I'm four years after 20 years service the senior level, Matt, so I'm, I'm hoping to get to that to, to there. So that's the, that's the plan anyway. That's good news anyway. Barry, um, I suppose 2022 was the first full year where we saw the split season. And um, how difficult was it to make the transition from the highs of the inter-county scene down, back down to the club level? Um, I suppose there's that. That bedding in period again, Matt, of um, just because obviously the match was successful and you went right away, right to the end. And I think you were only a week of kind of a turnaround before you were you were back into the action again. Um, so look, at, the first week was probably a little bit difficult uh, because you were just trying to recenter yourself and get yourself back. Um, and of course, give your your club teammates the the respect that that deserves as well. Do you know, um, so it was probably the first week was probably a little bit hard, all right, but. Once you got back in with the lads and started training with the club again and just got on their own, it's it's seamless, to be honest with you. There's, uh, like like the, year, the last few years, Matt, there's been no one kind of looking backwards and clapping yourself on the back for winning in all, in all Ireland. You're straight back into the ticket with your club. And, you know, as I said, that deserves the, that your respect too, you know, at the highest level as well. So, but Barry, you, your, your career to date with Kilmalak has coincided with a very, very successful uh, spell for the club four county titles in the in the in the last 12 years ab is absolutely phenomenal by any standard in in a county where the the the, the club championship is so competitive uh, definitely match you know like you, you look at the i think look at both groups and all the teams that are in both groups you know there's there's a puck of a ball between the majority of teams and even the perceived weaker teams you know i, I wouldn't class them as weaker teams um the championship is extremely healthy and extremely competitive. I think it, that coincides then, obviously, with the health of the inter-county game as well. You know, so all that work that has been done at, at grassroots level in clubs and then with the academies as well. You know, it is you can see it in fruition in the senior championship because you see Solibris turn patch as well over this year. They should have turned us over um, the year previous in the quarter final. They went to extra time and we just got up by the skin of our teeth. And um, you see it there, highly competitive as well. The Diamond Palace Henry went on a run this year as well. So you know, the, the landscape is changing. People said that there's only four teams in Limerick, but you know, the landscape is changing and it's only a matter of time before you see the likes of Moulin, the Mungrits um, and those teams as well push on and, and challenge that, that top group as well. Um, you won a very good county in 2021, um, Barry. Probably a bit disappointed last year, but disappointed probably with the performance in the final, maybe more so. Um, but there are still exciting times ahead for Kilmarnock with the like of Shane O'Brien, Connor Handy, Clark and those coming on the scene. Yeah, and look at Pierce Connery there, Matt, as well. Like, you know, there's there's a nice, um, you still have lads there, like Michal is still only 25, you've Oshid. Um, I suppose a group that maybe was perceived to be on its last legs, when you look at the older lads on the panel, has been just rejuvenated with, with the younger lads that have come in. Like, Shane was, Shane was a massive difference last year for us, you know, that you had that focal point up front. But at the end of it, like he was still only 18 years of age, you know, and as a group, you can't be relying on your, your 18 year old and his first year senior to get you over the line. Like, you know, it's up to us to mind him and bring him on. Um, but it's a good it's a good sign for the club. And there's more there's more younger lads there that are, are only champing at the bit to get through as well, um, which is great to see because, because as I said, it keeps it keeps competitive and it keeps us all honest um, and it stops any, I suppose, complacency keep creeping in. So. Kilmallock have a great tradition, Barry, in putting emphasis on underage structure and underage hurling. You were part of a glorious period in the noughties when, when Kilmallock were winning minor and under-21 titles at will. Yeah, and look, I think credit goes back there, Mac, to, to Paddy Kelly, um, Bernie Savage, Jim Maloney, um, McKean, God rest him, you know, there was a lot of people there, Mike O'Connor. Um, they were involved at that at underage level and brought us through. Um, and I suppose personally, especially Paddy Kelly, you know, Paddy was, um, he's a neighbour of mine and he was the fella that if Paddy spoke, you listened, you know, and you shut everything else out around your life and you listened to Paddy and what he said, you know. So um, the likes of him were, were massive for, for us because he just, he brought that team ethic and the team worked us and you know, obviously the skill side of then as well. And I think it obviously bore fruition then because we won, I think we won, in every age group, being honest, from 14s to 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 21, you know, so you can see when the work is done, it does come true. 
I'm just wondering, getting back maybe to the county briefly for the, the moment, what kind of a spectator will you will you be? Will you be an armchair spectator or will you go to the matches? Or um, I I haven't brought myself to go to one yet, Matt, but I've watched the last two on the telly, all right. Um, it's still a little bit uh, still a little bit raw, I suppose. Um, but not Do you get animated? Months. Yeah. Um, I suppose you're trying to remove yourself from being... I suppose look, I, I was probably in a similar position when you're watching on from the stand, you know, as, as you are from watching at home. But you know, I suppose what what the lads are trying to do, um, and what they're trying to go after. And then when you see things done well, you know, you're obviously excited from and you're you're delighted. And when you see things break down a little bit, you're probably as frustrated as you would be inside the stand. But, um, yeah, look, it'll we'll get to the match eventually. Match, I think. Uh, I'm targeting the end of the league anyway. Um. Like the, like the Outland, uh, the penalty are targeting the end of the league just before championship to to make the appearance, and then uh, definitely with look once the once the championship rolls around, uh, I plan on having the two small ladies with me, and we're we're going wherever the the bus is going. I'll cut across you there, Matt, because I am I am conscious of time. We have you for, but I'll keep you for another few minutes, Barry, if you don't mind. Um, obviously your retirement, and we've lost Shane Sicky and Richie McCarthy in the last few years. Can you start to see that new crew coming through, the likes of Out of English, who you saw close person, Colin Coughlin for you well. Carl O'Neill and even your club night, Shane O'Brien, that it has been a core group for the last five or six years that there's a few younger lads starting to break through. Yeah, there is. And to be fair, like you used to live, even looking at the, the demographic um, and the age group on, on the team, Jack, like you still have a lot of hurling left from a lot of the big big names. There's still, like there's a lot of them in their late 20s as well. Um, but like those younger lads, I think John has a great knack of integrating those younger lads into squads and into into teams and across leagues and championships, you know. Um, he just seems to always have the right answer of when to, to let the, the horse out of the, the paddock, you know, and let him go. Um, and it's worked over the years. Um, but look, he, there's an incredibly experienced spine on the team as well. And, you know, he's well able to build around that as well. And those lads like Cahill and Colin, like they got their, they got exposure the first couple of years. Paddy O'Loughlin was the same, Joe played in the Ireland final. At a very very young age as well, and you know, you just you give a lad that taste of it, and they're only chopping it a bit, then get a little bit more out of it. Um, and for the likes of Adam, who I suppose spent a little bit of time on the, the injury table last year, like this is going to be a big year for him. Um, you can already see it with UL, like he's flying it, and he saw it against Clare, and he was put into the middle of the field where he had the space to to show off his his skill set. You know, he just he fitted in seamlessly, and that's that's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter who it is, um, everyone in the group just steps up seamlessly and nothing ever changes. There's no change of tactics. There's no reverse eventing. It's literally full steam ahead, no matter who's there. Yeah, and just off the field for a moment, you obviously had a very good um, podcast, the Player's Voice podcast. I definitely recommend anyone on Spotify. And you spoke to off the ball as well, that you dealt with an eating disorder when you were younger. And I suppose what I took from it was that the, the key was to, I suppose, speak out about it. And if you were to say it now, you know, your overriding message from someone that's gone through it and is probably living with it. What, how would you, what would you say to someone that has experienced something similar? Yeah, I suppose look to having an open dialogue with someone, whether it's a friend, um, a, a trained professional, you know, anyone that you feel that you you can, you, I suppose you can trust or just talk to, and um, to have an open dialogue and speak to someone about it. Because look, I even after the last couple of months and the exposure that's after getting, you still find it a little bit hard to to maybe articulate your feelings and speak to someone about it. You nearly still get a little bit embarrassed when someone says it's you know, or fair play to you for for speaking about it. Um, but look, if you just wanted to try and raise a bit of awareness around it, and that um, if it helped one person, that it was a massive success on my part. Um, it wasn't. It was the farthest thing from looking for attention. Anyway, I can tell you, um, because I don't, I don't uh, do attention well, but. Um, yeah, look, if it helps someone, great, and just to speak out and just have to start that initial conversation with someone because stubbornness, Jack, was the big thing for me. Uh, I was too stubborn and probably too proud to, to speak to someone about it, um, just for fear of what they might might have thought of me at the time. So um, definitely just speak to someone because there's there's incredible services there. I oh, know yeah, it was definitely brilliant here, and there's obviously that stigma is still there, but we're slowly breaking it down. But to see you know a high-profile player like yourself to come out, I'm sure help far more than that one but again if it only help one it's it's beneficial to everyone um before you go just a, a few quick questions um just personal point of view um favorite venue with the club and county for you to play in club and county favorite venue um i parky Cueve, anyway. I, I just parky Cueve is uh, outside of crow park i think everyone loves the crow park but uh, parky Cueve is an, uh, just an amazing facility and amazing surface as well and it kind of held that that old atmosphere that the old uh, Parky Cueve had, that bowl. Um, so I used to, to love travelling down there. Um, 
from the club point of view, I think the work that's gone into the Gaelic rounds there in the last year has been incredible. Like the county final there last year, I've, I've never seen the surface as well. Um, so I'm actually excited to see how it's going to turn out this year for even the Intercounty Championship when it was given six or seven months to, to really be looked after and, you know, once the, the summertime kicks in and the sun starts to hit it again. Um, really looking forward to that. Uh, used to love going to Bruff, I suppose, as well. Uh, Jack, we spent more time in Bruff than we did in so. Yeah. Um, favourite player growing up? Um, a hybrid of Don Cusick and Brendan Cummins, if you could take a half each. And at club level, then was there any goalkeeper around you're looking up to, or even in Kilmallock? Ah, sure, I suppose. Look, usually, was, my father played goals before me, and I took the reins off him. So you would always kind of, you you were trying to break away from under that shadow of, you know, is this Tom Hennessy's son there, or will he be better than his father? And that's <laughs> that's always in the back of your head too that you want to to rubber stamp that that you are. So um, that's the end that I am. But um, yeah, you didn't have too far to look anyway. So uh, yeah, you you forged your own successful career anyway, that's and. It. Best player you played against that could be a goalie or an outfield player that you used to dread coming against? Oh, I used to dread playing against. Um, I don't know if he's much of a goalie now, but no, David Dempsey. Um, David Dempsey's a wizard, an absolute wizard. I've seen him do things in training and just you think you've him cocked um, and you think you've his his tail uh, got, but no, he's just, he's just amazing what he can do with early in the ball. So. And best player played with then? Uh, it could be David again or. Uh, best player I played with. That's a hard question, though, Jack. There's a lot of good players there. Um, uh, I know it's a bit of a soft spot for Shane Siki, just his, you know, outside of traveling training and the whole lot. Um, just his application, like, and just his dedication was just phenomenal. Like, if you, like himself and Nicky, like, if you looked at two fellas that you just, if anyone ever asked you, what's, what does a Limerick Curler look like, you'd, you'd say Shane Siki and Nicky Quaid, like, they're the two. That just epitomise everything about well, what it is to be a Limerick hurler in terms of skills and on the field and off the field. And finally, your best memory, a hurling memory, I suppose. Um, twenty eighteen be hard to top, you know, but even look twenty ten winning a, a county championship with your club was was massive for us, you know. And then counties county side of it, twenty eighteen was just it was amazing. It was probably one of the, the best moments there, there, there ever was. So. Don't tell my wife Hopefully we'll <laughs> hope be able to experience the first at Ireland from the stand later on this year. Jeez, but yeah. look, Barry, you've been very generous with her with your time a half an hour there. I, I told you 15 minutes but um, <laughs> <they're laughs> okay. for, for staying on. And I think thank you, I suppose, to the Limerick public for a brilliant career, first and foremost, and the role you played in helping Limerick, you know, reach tights they have. And please God, those will continue. But I'll let you get back to work there. Um, and best of luck in the future. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again once the, the club championship rolls around. Please God. Thanks very much, Barry. Thanks, Jack. Right. Thanks, Thank Matt. You. Cheers.